Welcome to Alpha Beta Launch FinTech Founder Stories presented by Scylla. I'm your host, Katie Bauer. Today, we are talking to Bo Jang, co-founder and CEO of Lithic. Bo, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thanks for having me. You know, you and I have talked before. We got together and uh, had some great conversation at uh, Finnovation in Las Vegas. So it's nice to be reunited and talk to you guys again, this time for the Alpha Beta Launch podcast. Indeed, it's great to see you again. So we want to highlight all of the amazing things that Lithic is doing and share your journey because it's been a unique journey and uh, you guys have been around for a couple of years. You guys have, have been learning lots of things and growing as a company. So we're excited to have you on. For people that are not familiar with Lithic and what you guys do and the, uh, the cards that you guys are all about, Tell us a little bit about Lithic and uh, what you guys do as a company for, for folks that aren't familiar. Yeah, so absolutely. I'll give a quick bit of company history here. So we started about seven years ago as a consumer virtual card business called privacy.com. Uh, the way to think about privacy.com is it's basically a password manager except for your card information. As a consumer, you can easily generate a new uh, payment card for every purchase you want to make online. So um, think about it as being, it's really good for everything from your personal security to managing your subscription spending to, you know, making sure that your kids don't spend thousands of dollars on in-app purchases. <laughs> um, and um, privacy has been a great business and continues to grow. Uh, but the Lithic story kind of came out of a challenge that we had ourselves. Uh, we built privacy on a third-party legacy card issuing processor that was about 20 years old at the time. And as we scaled, we found out that like, you know, we ultimately had to rebuild all of our own infrastructure piece by piece because uh, we just kind of hit these scaling problems um, on the existing infrastructure. What, one you know, really tactical you know, micro example is you know, most legacy card issuer processors are built for physical cards. So it doesn't really matter if your card create API goes down for a couple hours. Uh, you know, the customer maybe gets the card in six days instead of five days. Uh, but when someone is generating a virtual card, they're expecting that instantly. So in order to deliver on that instant card experience, we actually had to become PCI compliant, cache and store cards. Otherwise, the alternative was, you know, you have your system go down for a couple hours, you know, in the middle of the night randomly uh, every, you know, couple weeks, right? And, you know, over the years, we would talk to folks new to the card industry, uh, mostly neobanks initially, but, you know, also other companies where generating cards is a very essential part of their core business. And the people we talked to would you know, basically universally be frustrated with their existing card issuer processor. Uh, and a lot of them would say like, hey, like, you know, you seem to be pretty happy with your own solution. Like, can we just use your APIs? And that basically led us to this realization that the broader market really needs what we built for ourselves originally. And a couple of years back with a handful of customers, we launched basically what became Lithic. Um, and what year was that? That was 20, you know, we really started working hand in hand with design customers and design, par design partners and early customers um, in 2019. Um, and since then, it's been a wild ride. We went from being really capital efficient, you know, we raised less than $10 million in the first six years of our company life to raising over $100 million in the past year and quadrupling the team and, wow. you know, onboarding, you know, loads of uh, businesses and developers that uh, use our infrastructure. That's incredible. That's a, that's such a huge growth pattern over just a couple of years. And, you know, obviously you guys got your start before the pandemic, but certainly growing from, from Lithic you know, from privacy.com to Lithic right around that, that uh, pandemic time. So you guys have had certainly those, uh, those issues where the pandemic has been an impact as well. Was that, did the, was that something that like hurt or hindered you guys in that sort of growth period around 2019, 2020? It was, it was really interesting because we went through this phase of growth where um, it was, we entered the pandemic and we were about 25 people and everyone could fit into one room really easily. Communication was great. And, you know, as we went through this period of hyper growth, in many ways, 
uh, the pandemic helped us because it forced us to be crisper on communication and more deliberate about how we communicated as a team. Uh, and that coincided really well with this like, you know, period of really, really rapid headcount growth. Um, and the fact that, you know, we're able now to hire pretty much anywhere in the country has been definitely like really helpful for us. Were you guys already sort of remote as it was um, just being a company that's so focused on on online features or were you guys in office or? We, we were purely in office going into the pandemic. Um, and then, you know, we we I think like everyone else went uh, you know, fully remote uh, around, I want to say, February or March of 2020. Uh, thought we'd come back in six months. Uh, and, you know, here we are, <laughs> you know two years later and still, still fully remote. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think that'll change or do you guys expect to stay remote? I think we'll, we'll, we'll definitely have, uh, we'll, we'll definitely always be a remote first company. Uh, I think the question is really around uh, how we set up hubs in certain cities. For example, we've got around 60 people in New York city now. And so we have an office, um, you know, the Bay area is actually growing uh, contrary to uh, uh, you know, reports, uh, we, we've got, we've got a ton of folks in the Bay area now, uh, LA, you know, other parts of the country. Uh, so we're, we're standing up hubs and trying to figure out like that, like, you know, how we kind of bridge the gap and, um, provide folks with like a place to gather. So I, I want to go back to, uh, some of the, the early stages, the beginning, we talked about what your company and Lithic is all about, but tell me about the idea stage back before it became Lithic. You know, you, I know you have a huge background in mathematics, you're a graduate from MIT. So I feel like some of this is very natural for you, but translating the math side and numbers to software and computers and technology, was that a pretty seamless transition or where did this idea come from? Um, so the idea for privacy.com actually came from uh, the world of crypto. So um, this was around 2014, 2015, where we had this idea originally. Um, this was like the original crypto boom, if you will, um, where we wanted to make it easier for people to spend their crypto. Um, and, you know, Bitcoin, Doge, you know, Litecoin, whatever, uh, you know, coin you, you were mining at the time, um, we wanted to make it easier to spend it on traditional card rails. And so the original idea we had was like a debit card that, you know, would essentially um, allow you to spend that, uh, you know, cryptocurrency anywhere. The issue we ran into uh, is kind of silly. It's twofold. Uh, first of all, back then, no one really wanted to spend their crypto. Uh, and I think that is changing um, as it's you know picking up adoption. The second thing was, uh, you know, we went and talked to something like 50 banks. And I would say the banks fell into kind of two categories, either banks that uh, didn't know what crypto was, and banks are generally like more conservative. Uh, and so they were like, no, we're not that interested. Uh, and the second category is like, you know, the more forward looking folks that knew what bank knew what Bitcoin and cryptocurrency was. And those folks saw us and were like, definitely no, like, we're definitely not interested in working with you guys in this like sort of new cutting edge, like digital currency. Um, and so we kind of went back to the drawing board. Uh, and really kind of focused on the customer and the value that we can provide our customers. And that idea, you know, was like, hey, like there are a lot of these things, aspects of digital currency that are really nice. Uh, the fact that it's more secure, it's a push mechanism versus a pull mechanism, it's pseudonymous. Um, but on the other hand, like there are a lot of drawbacks. Like if I lose five Bitcoins, like I'm out of luck. You know, the, the benefits of centralization are that like you have like some kind of recourse if something goes sideways, right? And um, that's how we came up with sort of this original idea for uh, effectively a you know, password manager for your card info. So did, how did you end up getting a bank to work with you guys? Um, we, we, we basically fit it into sort of this, uh, this construct of like, 
a traditional uh, prepaid model where you partner with a sponsor bank um, and they kind of understand, hey, like we're doing prepaid card issuance already uh, in partnership with, you know, the green dots of the world. Yeah. Um, and so we, we kind of manage to over time basically speak the language um, that they spoke. And <laughs> um, that's how we got the product to market. Well, I mean, that's it's an interesting note because there are so many founders that we talk to that say, I had the door slammed in my face so many times by different banks and they have a, a very difficult time because, you know, either they're not interested in getting involved with cryptocurrency, you're not familiar, or they're considered competition. And so it's interesting how everyone has a unique journey with different banks. Is, is there something that you'd recommend as far as your experience banking wise that maybe helped you guys out that might help out uh, other entrepreneurs that are starting their own company specifically related to getting banks to partner on with you? I, first of all, I think the ecosystem has evolved dramatically since we were starting uh, back in 2014 and 2015. Um, but secondly, I think there's a lot to be said for uh, doing the, the legwork ahead of time and understanding the language and the vocabulary uh, that your bank partners are you know, used to speaking. Um, you know, I think there are things that if you don't take the time to do the homework ahead of time, uh, you're, you're sort of setting the conversation up for, for, uh, for failure. So tell us about that uh, sort of middle stages, and maybe this is where you guys switched over from privacy to lithic. Um, when that transition you were talking about was right around 2019, did you bring on more people or did the structure of the company change when you switched from privacy to lithic or maybe tell me about your first hire and, and did you guys add on when you became lithic? Yeah, so uh, the, the transition really was... Um... Pretty, pretty uh, seamless, actually. We, we thought that we would um, you know, try to work with a handful of companies uh, and you know, basically focus purely on virtual card issuance for them. And over time, uh, talk to more companies and just kind of pulled on that thread. Um, originally, how we did it was actually under the same privacy brand. And so we, were, we called it the Privacy Card Issuing API. Um, and the reason why we transitioned it over time to two separate brands was we just realized that, hey, like this is like it's this should be its own standalone brand and, you know, entity um, in many ways. And so um, it actually became sort of a really it, it seemed sudden, um, but was something that was in the works for us uh, really for about two years. So then privacy also exists now. It continues to exist and run. The way to think about privacy is it's um, it's like one of the original customers on on the Lithic platform. Tell me about your fundraising stage when you guys were first getting going. Um, you know, obviously you have to raise some capital to get things off the ground. Was this privately funded between you and your co-founders, or how did that work? Yeah, so um, our first institutional round of funding was really interesting. Um, this was back in 20, uh, 2016. Um, you know, we'd raised some angel funding before then, but our first institutional round was led by Index Ventures. Um, and we were super early and I honestly had no idea how to run a fundraising process. There's so much more material out there about how to run an effective process. Um, but we, you know, uh, we connected with the team there and uh, they took a really early bet on us. And uh, it's been it's been a really fun ride since then. We talked about uh, I just mentioned co-founders. Who are your co-founders or is it is it multiple people or who is on board with you? Yeah, so it's um, it's actually a really cool story. So I grew up in Kansas uh, and one of my co-founders, Jason, Jason Cruz, was uh, actually living down the block from me. Uh, and we were the two kids in Kansas that uh, built websites and you know, mobile apps back in the day. Um, and uh, David, our third co-founder, who's our head of design, actually grew up in the UK. And we met online uh, through, a, through a mutual friend who at the time, I think, was 12. We were like 13 or 14 and our mutual friend that connected <laughs> us. Uh, on uh, AIM at the time, I'm sort of dating myself. Oh my goodness, uh, yes. Was, uh, 
yeah, was, was something like 12. Uh, and we've been you know, good friends and uh, lucky, lucky to be partnering together since. Okay, so you have to talk more about this. So you have been interested in apps and software and development since a really early age? Yes, yes. Um, you know, I think what, what really drew me uh, to it is just like sort of this, like you build something, you put it out there and people are interacting with it and you're having a positive impact on people's lives. Uh, and, and there's there's something that's really sort of innately rewarding about that to me. So I want to go to, I want to talk about your experience at MIT. How does your background and your um, degree help translate into what you're doing with Lithic right now? How did that sort of prepare you for the fintech industry? I would say the thing that MIT provided me uh, and college in general provided me was I was fortunate to be in an environment with a lot of really smart people um, and a lot of resources to learn, to experiment, to try new things. Um, I'm not sure that's something that's entirely unique to MIT or my experience, but um, ultimately like what I found most valuable from college was uh, the opportunity to try new things, to um, you know, meet tons of smart people, uh, and to have a lot of resources to explore different paths that um, I found interesting. And with your co-founders, have you been building things with them since you guys were, you know, 12 and 13 years old? Because obviously 2014, 2016, all the way to 2019, I mean, there's, there's some years in between then. Have you guys started projects together and built different things as kids and as teenagers and as young adults? And that just kind of led to this naturally? We, we did. Um, we have for a while. Um, I like to see, so we actually, um, in high school built um, an early box competitor. Um, and if you remember way back when box used to be a consumer product before they pivoted into the enterprise and went way out market. Uh, I don't think they, you know, I think this is like super, this is like 20, 2005, 2006 timeframe. Um, and um, we ended up selling the company in high school. Um, and it was like a huge win. And I think that's a lot of, in a lot of ways, how we caught the bug. Interesting. That's great. I, I love that you guys were able to start to see, hey, you know what? We can do these things together and we're a good team and we should continue this somehow. That's pretty yeah. cool. So um, you guys have been around the block a little bit. Um, a lot of the, the founders we talked to are, are pretty new startups and some, some of them are, you know, maybe two, three years old. They started just before the pandemic or started in the pandemic, but you guys have a few miles on you um, just from privacy to lithic. So tell me in that experience, what kind of pitfalls do you guys have had to experience and overcome that maybe some of us can learn from uh, in the future? Yeah, I think it's really important. So I like to think of like, we've basically built two companies in the, you know, the experience of like one, uh, we had effectively this like almost bootstrap experience with privacy and like true, like venture scale, um, growth with Lithic. And I think it's important to be like really aware of which path you're on. Um, and if you're on the pseudo bootstrap one and you're not growing super quickly, or uh, if you're, um, you know, uh, if you've taken venture money um, and you're not growing super fast, I think it's just important to be sort of aware of that and um, sensitive to it. For us, like we never felt the pressure to grow faster, but I think if I had to rewind time, um, I think we could have, we heard from so many people that they wanted and needed a better card issuing processor before we finally decided to work with other companies that like, I, I think we could have saved ourselves a lot of um, heartache and, you know, accelerated the journey if we had started, you know, a year or, you know, even more earlier. Um, get given kind of uh, where the market signals were. So, so I, I would listen to the market um, if you're very early on in sort of pre-product market fit or not experiencing super strong product market fit. What, what would you say sets you guys apart from your closest competitors? What makes you guys different? Yeah, I think for us, it's really this focus on accessibility and modularity. So depending on who you're comparing us to, 
Um, they're either like very expensive and very difficult to get up and running with. Uh, we're looking at like, you know, half a million to a million dollars in uh, commitments, uh, six to 12 months in terms of implementation timeframes. Mm-hmm. Um, or they're like very much like a all, all in one, like a not very configurable uh, solution. And so for us, like our perspective is like, there's so much innovation going on in the financial services and, you know, fintech infrastructure industry, like in compliance, transaction monitoring, uh, you know, ACH money movement, like what you all are doing with Scylla where like, it doesn't make sense to like close yourself off to that. And so we've positioned ourselves and believe that the future of FinTech is really kind of modular and you know being unbundled right now. Oh, tell me about your, your thoughts on the FinTech industry. What's it like to be a founder and a CEO in this financial tech industry that is growing so fast and so quickly? Is that fun? Is it exciting? What what makes it such a unique place as opposed to other industries? It's definitely, it's super exciting. Um, I think there's also a lot of responsibility. Uh, you know, sometimes I look at my friends in you know, SaaS or, you know, working in other industries and like you're, if we go down or if we have issues, um, that has like a lot of impact on you know our downstream customers more so than if you're uh, maybe a you know a productivity tool or um, you know communication tool even. Um, and so uh, it's it's both exciting uh, but also like you know really rewarding. What would you say to people that are thinking about breaking into the fintech industry that have no real experience, but I've been dabbling with ideas that, I mean, obviously you've got really a background that has set you up for success, but maybe they're at that early idea stage and don't really have that background. What would you say about learning about the FinTech industry and breaking in and getting your idea rolling to become a, a, a new company? I think the best way to learn is by doing. So either by joining a company uh, or uh, starting something, um, that's oftentimes the best way to, to, to learn. And I think the other thing that I love about the fintech industry is like, everyone is so helpful. Um, we, you know, when we were starting out, uh, we asked so many silly questions and, um, had so many people that helped us out and point us, pointed us in the right direction, even though, um, there's really nothing that we could offer in re- return. And I think that mentality and mindset has really kind of, uh, permeated the industry. So um, I think you'll find that like folks are super willing to help out. I yeah. love that. Yeah. As, as people do have a lot of questions and, and uh, there's actually a lot of people we've talked to have said, reach out just a barrage of questions. It's important. You're going to need to ask these. And, you know, there is no silly question because you're, you're going to have to figure it out one way or another. So Bo, tell me a little bit about, paint the picture for me, if you will, of your target dream customer. Who do you guys uh, really iterate to and, and what you guys are, or who you guys are looking for? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, in some ways, the most interesting use cases for us are also really non-intuitive ones. Uh, companies that uh, maybe you and I don't think of as classically card companies. You know, uh, for example, we will work with folks in insurance claim disbursements. Uh, historically, that's something that's gone through check or ACH rails. And it really results in a worse customer experience because the customer is you know, fronting money while waiting for the claim, whereas the carrier or the insurance provider can't, you know, uh, track it easily and putting on a card actually and programmatically generating that and sending it off to the end customer um, results in like this dramatically better experience. Quicker uh, too, it seems like. Yeah, yeah. It's faster payments. It's more secure. Um, it's programmable. Um, another example is uh, we'll work with OTAs to fulfill flights and pieces of a purchase. Uh, so if you are going to Priceline and you want to buy a flight and a hotel and all this stuff, like Priceline is collecting payment for you. And on the back end, they're often using cards to fulfill these purchases. Um, you know, another example is uh, we'll work with companies that are focused on the incentives 
space where if you're doing an online survey, it's kind of unwieldy to send out tons of checks or, you know, ACH payments. And we can come in and provide an instant, you know, incentives product that allows you to, um, you know, disperse funds very quickly. Those are some of the like, just like out there kind of original, really disruptive things uh, that we've seen, seen people come about and, and build. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, floored every day when we talk to customers about different creative use cases that they're using the API for. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I'm sure it's it's probably evolved even, you know, since the the, you know, the last six, seven, eight years that you guys have been around. Uh, tell me what it's like working with Scylla. You know, I know that you were able to speak at Finnovation and that was interesting for a lot of folks that were there, but uh, tell me about what that experience, that relationship looks like and how, how you guys benefit mutually. You know, I think about this as, you know, very much in the same vein as like the primitives. Um, of financial services where we have cards and Scylla provides um, essentially bank transfers. Um, and so oftentimes uh, we'll have a customer that comes to us and wants one piece of the equation um, and you know doesn't mind kind of putting the two together in a way that works really well and allows them to kind of mix and match best and breed. Uh, we found it to be like really helpful in terms of just like expanding the number of use cases that we're able to service and still is able to service. Um, and I think what's been really important is sort of this shared philosophy around uh, enabling developers and building a really accessible uh, financial services. How did you hear about Scylla? Um, I think it must have been Shamir. Um, you know, big, big, big. Uh, we're all big fans of um, uh, Simple, and uh, I think in many ways they were pioneers uh, for the whole industry. And uh, I'm not sure how we got put in touch originally, but yeah. Tell me about your mission beyond revenue, Bo. Obviously, you guys want to make money as a company, but you're also trying to make this industry easier and more accessible. What is that mission beyond revenue for you guys? If you think about the anatomy of a car transaction, uh, you've got acquiring on one side and issuing on the other side. Uh, I think that issuing is at a stage that acquiring was at five to seven years ago. And what's really exciting about what all the innovators have done uh, on the acquiring side was that they approached acquiring in a way that uh, really abstracted away a lot of the complexity and made it super accessible to everyone. Uh, but they, they retained that sort of power, that configurability. Um, and I think about it as kind of the original primitive in many ways. Um, maybe they talked about APIs and things like that, but, but at the end of the day, like they made it very developer focused and very product focused. Uh, and in doing so, they didn't take market share from these 20, 30, 40 year old companies that you know, power a lot of payments today. Uh, they actually expanded what the world of acquiring looks like. Uh, the classic example I give is like, there's no way Stripe you know, starting in 2009 could have known that Shopify would come along a couple of years later and become basically their biggest customer. Uh, and I think sort of that expansion of what the world looks like is really kind of what powers us and what motivates us. Uh, there's, there's a similar size opportunity if we're able to take this thing that is super complex and super expensive and make it, make it accessible to developers and businesses everywhere. You just mentioned the word complex. How complex is it to do what you guys are doing? I know that there's a lot of red tape and hurdles. What's it been like navigating through some of those? Yeah, it's it's a financial services product. So it's incredibly complex in terms of the number of partners that you have to work with, uh, compliance, regulation, um, approvals of uh, you know your card art, um, depending on your use case, um, you know agreements and user agreements, uh, compliance. So um, I I think it's you know it is very the reason why it's lag is that um, I think card issuing is more complex than card acquiring, 
but that also presents a massive opportunity in my mind. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. It definitely presents opportunities. Um, so what would your advice be for future entrepreneurs? We've kind of breezed over this in a few ways, but just looking at it as a whole, um, entrepreneurs, startups who are, you know, still at that idea on a napkin stage, what would you say is your biggest advice from what you and your co-founders have learned over the years? Uh, that's a good question. Um, hmm. I'm sure you've had so many learning experiences. I mean, since you guys kind of, it, it seems like you guys have really grown up together too. <laughs> so I'm going to go a little meta. Uh, I, I, I posit that almost all meaningful startup advice is contextual. Uh, I remember when we were smaller, a lot of the advice was around really surviving. So don't, you know, run out of money. Don't focus on press. Just focus on, you know, talking to your customers and building uh, conferences are a waste of money. Uh, and I think that was true at, you know, the two or three person stage for us. Uh, but what makes sense for the company and the investments that you make uh, really need to evolve and scale. Similarly, I think uh, the most helpful advisors or investors to have around the table are uh, folks that are usually one or two stages ahead of you or have seen the story before. They will have dealt with literally the same types of challenges that you're going through now, not too long ago. You know, if uh, Elon Musk, I'm sure, is a great operator, uh, but he probably is not going to be helpful at all for uh, most seed stage companies. Um, and another example here is there's a classic phase of growth you go through where uh, you go from say 20 or 30 people to over hundred, which we just did. Um, and a lot of things break and you find that you can avoid making the same mistakes if you have uh, the right folks involved. Are you guys having fun? You guys are still really young in this industry and it seems like you guys have really broken through and sort of changed the mold of things. But I know that that can be a stressful process. Is being a part of this industry and creating a more user-friendly experience and making, kind of paving the path through different opportunities in fintech is that is that still fun for you guys, or is it stressful, or is it both? What's it like? Yeah, it's it's stressful. It's fun. Uh, the only thing I can say is it's never boring. Uh, it's but it's it's certainly like a lot of fun. It's gratifying. Um, I think we're in still like the super, super early innings here. And um, yeah, it's, it's just so exciting. So some of the founders that we've talked to have said they started in a garage, they started working, you know, from a diner or a cafe. Where, where did you guys start? And, and how many did you, did you start with? Is it just you and your, your two friends that you grew up with or the one friend that you grew up in, with and met? Um, tell me about those real early stages. We started, you know, uh, basically in the basement of a townhouse in uh, East Winsburg. And uh, it's, yeah, it was, you know, the three of us. And um, yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun back in, back in the day. Um, that, that was, um, and then at some point we hired more people and it started being like, okay, like maybe we need to move out of the basement of the townhouse and get a proper office. And uh, so we moved into our first office in, uh, in Chinatown in New York City. And how big are you guys today? We are just shy of 140. I think we're 137 or 138. And where all do you have hubs? Uh, so New York, New York's the only official hub, but we've got clusters of folks in the Bay Area and LA, uh, Austin, Texas. Um, I think I think those are the main ones. Are you guys primarily just um, focused on the U.S. right now, or do you guys hope to branch out internationally at some point? Uh, we are U.S. only today, but uh, def definitely interested in, in uh, international. Bo, this has been a great conversation, and we've kind of like flown through a lot of these topics, but it's been very educational for, for me and I think for our listeners. Is there anything you want to leave us with in parting? Any, anything about Lithic, any projects or uh, future news that you guys have coming out that you think would be interesting to uh, our listeners? I will just plug that um, we are hiring, uh, like everyone else, and uh, so... If you're looking, uh, we're hiring across all roles, um, lithic.com slash careers. Um, that's, that's my main plug. Um, what what kind of jobs press. are you guys hiring for? 
Um, hiring across the board. So engineering, product, operations, uh, go to market, sales, um, account management. Um, yeah, just hiring across the board. Can people reach out to you for more information if they have questions about their own startups? Or yeah, absolutely. My email is uh, Bo at lithic.com and feel free to drop me a line. I love it. Well, Bo, thank you so much for coming on the show today. It was, you know, it was great to see you back at Finnovation. It's even better to see you and have you on an uh, Alpha Beta launch, but we really appreciate you taking the time to share your wealth of experience and we certainly wish you the best of luck. Thanks, Katie. Appreciate it. Thanks for listening to Alpha Beta Launch Fintech Founder Stories presented by Scylla. I'm your host, Katie Bower. If you enjoyed this conversation with Bo, be sure to check out all our episodes, rate, share, and subscribe to the show.